I'm going to introduce Stephen Humphreys. He is the artist, the photographer, uh, attorney, art historian, collector. Um, uh, wine importer. <laughs> wine connoisseur. Anyway, all right, so Stephen Humphreys studied painting at an early age at uh, Birmingham Museum of Art as an undergraduate at Princeton, uh, undergraduate in English, as, uh, but French and art history, and actually the art history was a big part of your influence and in what you do today with art and photography. Um, and then uh, um, after graduation, Humphreys began a career in government service working in Washington in the U.S. Senate. Uh, that opened doors to extensive travel. Um, Humphreys went to study law at the University of Georgia uh, the School of Law graduated first in his class. Oh, awesome. As an attorney in Georgia, he uh, been focused on international, or sorry, the intersection of government corruption and election interference, which uh, he may talk about. Uh, this is carried on into what happens when it's happening in Ukraine. Uh, with that interference has to do with Russian interference. Um, and then, of course, uh, after uh, February 22, when the war broke out, um, Stephen started working as an attorney there for you want me to uh, investigating yeah. human rights issues and uh, has been going back ever since. Um, he spent most of the last year in Ukraine teaching Ukrainian university at Ukrainian universities, working with the Ukrainian You're parliament. Welcome, sir. And this is the continuing issue of disinformation and attacks on uh, disinformation. Uh, and that's both in the Ukraine and in the United States. Throughout the course of the year, Humphreys has traveled all over U Ukraine with his camera, including the danger zones along the Eastern Front. Humphrey says his hopes, he hopes the exhibition of his photographs from Ukraine will raise awareness of the plight of its people and reinforce support from Americans for the struggle for self-determination and resistance to tyranny. And uh, you may want to mention something about the prints and if there's anything, you know, uh, I think we're trying to do some kind of uh, benefit uh, with the sales. So if there are any sales from this, um, he's going to donate to certain causes in Ukraine. So anyway, please welcome Stephen Humphreys. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, so, um, well, it's hard to know where to begin to talk about a year in Ukraine. Um, and uh, as Jose said, I'm wearing a lot of different hats there. I'm working as an attorney, I'm working as a journalist, I'm helping produce uh, films. We um, showed uh, the first um, film that's uh, finished and is about to go into distribution. Uh, showed it here last night. We have uh, two more with that group, the uh, British group, and then I'm working on two more with the Ukrainian group. So that's a lot of work. I have, I have a lot of uh, full-time jobs, and then add on that all the uh, attorney stuff, both working on the war crimes investigations and also working on some civil cases against the Russians. Uh, it's a long, complicated thing, but obviously the idea is to make them pay for that, uh, all that damage and uh, destruction. Um, the damage and destruction in Ukraine, you can't um, even imagine. And um, um, kind of part of the uh, point of this show, and also the one that's in Tuscaloosa right now, it shows uh, some of that, but also, um, and I decided um, to uh, kind of come back from, you know, behind the scenes. I have lots of pictures of uh, stuff blowing up and tanks and stuff that are kind of interesting. But um, I decided to pull back a little bit and try to show in the middle of the destruction, you know, the lives of the people in Ukraine and try to go on and, you know, lead their, um, lead their lives and some of the um, you know, very strange juxtapositions of the, you know, destruction and the, you know, human life that, you know, goes on um, in 
in spite of it. Um, the other thing I should mention is like out of all the things I'm doing, all the hats I'm wearing, they all what they all have in common is you know telling the story of Ukraine, whether it's in films or in photographs or in writings or in court, um, uh, and it's um, you know an, not only an incredible story that needs to be told, um, and um, but it's also um, a story that's being attacked by an incredible wave of lies and propaganda um, to try to undermine American support for Ukraine. It's been a little disturbing to me, so I just got back from three months there, and during that time, I could like feel a noticeable change. Like when Russia first invaded, I felt like there were people in America pretty much agreed, like that's terrible. Like I think Russia. And uh, I come back to all this, like, why are we up in Ukraine? And maybe Putin's not so bad. And, but, you know, I, yeah, I mean, as absurd as that is, I mean, you, you can, it's not hard to find uh, people saying that and people uh, making millions of dollars with um, millions of, of viewers. I won't, you know, mention the names of like Tucker Carlson, one of them, you know, it's like, uh, you know, unbelievable. Um, I can personally, I can hardly watch it. I, if I watch this mouth moving and hear this stuff coming out, I'm like, um, uh, one thing. I'm, you know, uh, other thing I forgot to mention. I'm teaching at two different Ukrainian universities, which that's been a very cool, fun experience to work um, with those students. Um, and um, and I'm working on setting up. A, a joint program between the universities in Ukraine and the University of Alabama, which I hope will be you know a huge productive thing. But there, you know, two parts of that. One is um, is that uh, Americans need to know a lot more about um, Ukraine. When I went to college, I mean, we didn't have any way to study about Ukraine. There weren't a lot of Ukraine courses. Nobody really cared. Now it's maybe the most important thing going on in the world, and people don't have much of a basis of knowledge about it, and it's, which makes it easier for people to creep in with all these lies. And, um, Stephen, what will the joint program consist of between Ukraine and uh, Well, um, I can't really even <laughs> begin to say, well, one, it hasn't completely uh, happened yet, but, um, but, um, uh, working with the College of Arts and Sciences and the law schools there to create all these, you know, programs where um, they'll be, well, what, uh, well, let me tell you what's uh, starting this fall, it hasn't officially, you know, opened as a new program, but what's already happening is this fall in Tuscaloosa, for the first time ever, they'll be teaching Ukrainian language, and, you know, I went to college, you couldn't take Ukrainian, nobody cared about Ukrainian, and, you know, now it's, it's an important language and it's going to be taught for the first time at, at Alabama. Um, and so there's some, you know, little things like that uh, starting. Mostly, <laughs> mostly the program consists of me teaching, you know, in these Ukrainian um, uh, universities, and I'm teaching law and history classes. I'm actually teaching a class that I created for the University of Alabama, which is the legal history of the civil rights uh, movement in the U.S., which the Ukrainians are <laughs> surprisingly interested in, but it also, um, you know, our story here has a lot of parallels um, with uh, what they're um, going through. And um, so, but anyway, that's just another example of, of the story needs to be told. So Americans, there's two parts to it though. You know, Americans are woefully uneducated about Ukraine and what's going on in Ukraine and what's important about Ukraine, not only for them, but for us. Uh, what's in, important for us. Um, if anybody's interested, I've, I've you know, written a couple of articles that are in, have been in the AL.com. One of them just came out two days ago and one of them came out over the 4th of July weekend. I talked more about all this stuff. We have two of them here on the... Oh, yeah. Okay. 
So, um, anyway, so I have been busy trying to um, uh, get the word out and tell the story of Ukraine and, um, and as, um, which I think I'm qualified to do, <laughs> having seen it and, you know, been on the, you know, front line with artillery shells flying over my head, I think I'm you know, qualified to, to um, speak. Uh, I really, actually, I really kind of enjoy it. There's so many people, you know, spouting some little, uh, you know, alt-right, you know, lies about um, uh, Ukraine, and I, I kind of enjoy it when I encounter them because they can't, uh, they can't really, you know, they have a hard time arguing. <laughs> people who got their, you know, all their information from some person talking on TV. Um, you know, for somebody who's, you know, been there and seen it with their own eyes and experience, it's hard for them to stand up with all their little stories that they got off of, off of, um, off of the, the TV. But anyway, it's a, it's a huge need. It's also, um, the other way the program works is, you know, you know, and I've told, you know, the Ukrainians, and I work with a lot of people in their parliament and the president's office and things like that, that, you know, they, uh, also need to be educated and informed to understand like what's happening here in the United States and what uh, people are saying. I just saw something that they did a poll of likely Republican voters in the Iowa caucuses and like half of them said we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine, which I find just like, you know, that amazing. Is it like basically an isolationist? Thought, or actually liking Putin, or like I stay away from this new stuff because it makes me. Well, <laughs> it depends on how you know deep down you want to go into. But there's a lot of I'll give you one example. It's a lot of you know Russia was justified to invade Ukraine because <laughs> Ukraine was talking about joining NATO and that was a threat to Russia, and so therefore, and um, I kind of like I never really heard of that as a reason to invade. Well, the not to mention the fact that, like, we're in, like, NATO's our side. They're trying to get over to our side, right? Yeah. <laughs> but whatever. I mean, facts don't yeah. matter. So, um, but anyway, um, I don't think the Ukrainians are as aware as they need to be of this little movement that's creeping in the United States. So anyway, I'm trying to, uh, you know, play both sides of the, um, of the bridge. But anyway, all of those things are all about telling the story about Ukraine and the truth about Ukraine. I don't think I just uh, I don't think people um, have much understanding. Um, part of the, part of the reason I got into it is I had been working on some of the investigations of the Russian election interference, which I'm still working on, and um, and it's people don't understand how um, directly connected to Ukraine that is. I mean, people are aware like. Uh, Donald Trump got impeached once for something in Ukraine. <laughs> I understand too much, but um, but the um, the Russian attack on our elections, which was huge. If you hear people saying, "Oh, that's a hoax," "It's a Russia hoax," that's a lie. That, that was not a hoax. I'm sorry. Didn't they send out a bunch of propaganda bots? Well. They had like hundreds of millions of fake stories on Facebook. I remember seeing some of them. Like the, it looked like a news story that said the Pope has endorsed Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I looked at it. That can't be true, and it wasn't true. That came from a Russian troll farm farm in Saint Petersburg. All those people ended up being indicted by um, uh, Robert Mueller. Um, but um, uh, but you'd be you know shocked at. The degree to which that um, intelligence operation penetrated down to the state level in Georgia and Alabama and places that you would be a little shocked. But we have, we're kind of at war with ourselves on it because this whole narrative has been put out on the other side that, oh, it's a hoax and nothing really happened and that's all discredited. And none of that is true. And so, anyway, so Americans are very badly uninformed on the subject. Ukrainians are not as uninformed on the subject as they should be, but just to like basically walk through the, um, the 
basics of it. Um, you know, the Ukrainians for a long time have been wanting to, well, um, you know, the Ukrainians really brought about the goal of Ronald Reagan, the great Republican, you know, hero, uh, who wanted to bring down the Soviet Union. And it was really Ukraine that accomplished that in 1991 when they voted for independence. They said, we don't want to be part of the Soviet Union. And that's what really sent the Soviet Union um, down the tube. So they had been trying to go away from Russia and being aligned as part of a you know sphere with Russia and move more towards Western uh, Western Europe and the United States. And uh, that had been going on for a long time in the um, uh, uh, the period like uh, two thousand. Um, 10, uh, a guy named Viktor Yanukovych ran for president of Ukraine. His principal strategy advisor was Paul Manafort, who <laughs> ended up being Trump's campaign manager. Um, and they campaigned as though they were agreed with the rest of Ukraine and they were going to join the European Union and, you know, make Ukraine part of Western Europe. They were because secretly um, aligned with Putin, and despite their public statements, they were actually trying to bring Ukraine uh, back into um, uh, Russia's orbit. And Paul Manafort was actually paid not only to do that in Ukraine, but to bring countries all over the world and into Russia's orbit and make them align with Putin, which is like a, you know one little known fact about the <laughs> supposed Russia hoax. And um, so anyway, the Ukrainians revolted against that, 2014. So 2014 is a big year, Ukrainians revolt. They, uh, Yanukovych and Manafort have to flee the country. Yanukovych flees to Moscow, where he still is a vector. Manafort came back here to become Donald Trump's <laughs> campaign manager. Um, but immediately after, immediately after that revolt, the, um, that's immediately Putin sent all the forces into Crimea and eastern Ukraine. And that's a war that's been going on since 2014. The United States uh, responded by putting sanctions on Russia for um, invading uh, Ukraine, which was the big issue in the 2016 election. About, that's what the meeting at Trump Tower was about, about getting rid of the sanctions that the U.S. had put on Russia. So anyway, but it was a direct chain reaction thing. They threw out Yanukovych, Putin invaded Crimea, U.S. put sanctions on Russia, and then Putin immediately ordered the attack on the U.S. elections. And we see that you know malware started being placed on in U.S. election systems in 2014. This all happened. Bam, 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 bam. We got to the 2016 election. Nobody understand, <laughs> understands that any of this has happened. Nobody knows what's going on. You start seeing Facebook posts saying the Pope has endorsed, you know, a particular candidate, and you like, can't be right. It wasn't right. It's all uh, fakery. But they also, we now know that they, uh, the Russians hacked all 50 state election systems, and you know, it hasn't really come out exactly what the point of that is. But anyway, my point is that a lot of our uh, most important political issues that we face today derived directly from Ukraine and, um, and the conflicts there. So anyway, that's not much about photography, but <laughs> anyway. Stephen, I, Stephen, can I, I mention one thing in connection with what you just said? Yeah. Uh, one of the people that, when, when I was in Ukraine and I interviewed, was a sociologist, and I asked her what was the most important support the United States could give to Ukraine, and I thought she would say, you know, consulting, financial. She said the most important part was to learn something about Ukraine. Yeah, well, and I think that's true. I mean, that's and that's my point. People need to know, and I guess uh, my talk sounds, you know, maybe a little political, but I'm really just trying to tell you all facts. I mean, these are all things. These are facts. This is not a political opinion. These are things that happen, and um, and they're things that we have to address today. So anyway. I've gone all over Ukraine, photographing all the destruction, being shot at, <laughs> and, um, and 
student bag sometimes, and but also, you know, trying to capture a little bit of the, you know, the, the feeling of the of the Ukrainian people as they try to live through all of that. And I'd be happy if anybody has any questions about anything in general about the photography or about a particular photograph or. Well, one question I have is, is that as a lawyer, so the, so documentary is about telling the truth and having this you know, document of something that, that really happened. And you're, you are the source, primary source, because you're there. And, and the question is, is, is there a, a point where your photography is proof in a, in a case or in a legal way that something that's happened. Well, yeah, there's a lot of photography like that. It would be very interesting for a gallery exhibition, but I mean, there are photographs of graves, mass graves, of um, you know, destruction uh, left behind, of uh, use of uh, illegal and weapons. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that for Lots of reasons I don't show. You're not making Right, sure. Okay. Yeah, I think there's Well, I'm glad you said that because really that's the first thing that I should have said when you're talking about Ukraine and telling the story about Ukraine. That's really the first and most important thing is how brave they were. I mean, you just imagine it's sort of like, you know, somebody tells you Russia's about to invade and they're going to like, oh, okay, or we're going to like, yeah. let them come in and or, or say, you know, no, we don't want to be part of Russia and, you know, we'll, we'll fight. But, but I, anyway, I like seeing people like trying to also, you know, live their lives while they're being brave and then in this yeah. situation. It's well, it's an amazing, amazing thing to live through, like Dasha's high school <laughs> graduation in Kimelnitsky, and they just had had a huge missile attack there, a huge missile attack right before this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they, you know, still there with their, got their pretty dresses and the flowers and everything. You know, that, that's one thing. Remember, Stephen, when you posted that picture that you were at the symphony? Oh, was yeah. Thinking, What's he doing at the symphony? That's crazy. Well, it is, it, is cra it is crazy. Well, when I first started going there, all of that was shut down. And that's kind of, I, I love it. There's one thing I love about Ukraine is that's kind of their defiance. They, they started saying, you know, they're not going to stop us. Well, one, you know, one of the lies of Putin is there's no Ukrainian culture, that this is not really a real thing, it's not really a country, and it's really part of Russia. The, the culture in Ukraine far outshines, you know, anything coming from, um, from Russia. And the opera and the ballet, all these, well, so first it was all shut down. Every museum closed, beautiful old opera house, nothing happening here. And then they started to do the productions again, and I thought, that's incredible. And so I started going uh, to them. So I've been to lot, <laughs> lots of ballets and operas in uh, Ukraine now. And um, you imagine these old European opera houses, and you know they have all these balconies going up the side, and they're very ornate, and then the top there, there's a big round, you know, circular ceiling with all this ornate stuff and glass. And, and I just sit there and do an opera and go, oh, there's a missile doesn't come through. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you know, because the, street, the Russians target stuff like that. They fired on theaters, they fired on hospitals, and they, they pioneered all this stuff in um, Syria and Chechnya. It's not, nothing new, that's what, they, that's what they do. It's not an accident that they're killing civilians, they do it on purpose. And um, uh, they just had an incident last weekend in Chernihiv, north of Kiev, where they had a, a religious holiday, and at the time everybody was leaving church that fired missiles in the you know, town square and killed all these people. Mm -hmm. 
church. And, you know, so, um, like I said, I don't, if, I'm not here to <laughs> give a political speech, but if you hear anybody, you know, saying, well, maybe Russia's not that bad, or maybe Putin's not that bad, or maybe we should sympathize with them, or maybe they're justified, you just leave them. Okay, anybody have any other questions? Okay. Great. Right. Thank you so Thank much, you. Stephen. Thank it's you. been really wonderful. Yeah. Filmmaker in, the, in Ukraine, Sergei Romenko, who is uh, working on a couple of uh, films uh, that are about Mariupol. You probably heard of it. was a you know, giant you know, siege there, huge. Uh, battle there, and um, of course, uh, there's a, a, obviously a lot of work, uh, there's a lot of organization that goes into this, and a lot of uh, raising money, so like, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is uh, uh, work on you know, getting the money to uh, produce all these things. So, uh, yeah. Do you all have any questions? I'll go ahead and turn the sound down. Anybody got any questions for Stephen? No. Good job. So, so, so why did you uh, want to go to Ukraine to uh, make the documentary on that? Well, um, that's a good question. And I, that's, and, uh, I should introduce uh, James Yellen. I appreciate uh, coming all this way. Also went to Ukraine to make some documentary films. But um, I think everybody I've talked to was uh, they say the same thing. It's like uh, you know it's the most important thing going on in the world, and they you know felt like they had to go there and uh, do something uh, to help and, and try to um, tell the story of of, uh, of Ukraine. And there's so much. I mean, there's a lot in that um, film that's really um, just scratching the surface and the. Um, and it's you know, changing all the time. It's very strange for me <laughs> to watch it, because usually in a film you're seeing places and uh, people you're not familiar with. It's, um, uh, it's strange to watch it with all the places that I've you know, just spent the last three months uh, in that area. But it gives you some uh, idea uh, of, of what it's like, that uh, you know, the shelling goes on all the time so you come back to the United States and you're like, what's wrong? There's no shelling. <laughs> what's that? Who turned off the shelling? And um, so it, it uh, takes a get used to it. It's amazing, you know, how the, you know, Ukrainians who, who live there, it's amazing how many Ukrainians are still living out in those areas in Kherson and Seversk and all these places um, where you just, you know, can't imagine do it and they don't uh, intend to go anywhere and they don't intend to become part of Russia either. So. Every time you hear a door slam on a car, that thing. Uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, um, what's the closest you've ever been to uh, to any Russian forces? Um, well, uh, so um, I, I don't uh, I don't know if I can say exactly uh, uh, you know my roles over there and I work also with the Ukrainian military but you know it's not my job to get into combat with the Russians it's like kind of my job to avoid them but um, so we um, uh, have spent a lot of time like within a kilometer of the Russian lines and actually. You know, uh, been with the Ukrainian military intelligence actually, you know, four ways, actually, you know, uh, behind the lines. Um, but like I said, we're uh, trying to, in those cases, trying to avoid them, not, to, <laughs> not to, um, um, get in conflict with them. But, um, so, but I mean, I mean, you feel the presence all the time, but you get a little bit of an idea of, you know, from, uh, the film of all the artillery and missiles and things going off. Um, the 
closest I've had a missile come to me was uh, uh, one, uh, one hit from a couple of blocks away. And that was actually not out of the front line. It was in um, Kiev, which you think is irrelevant to say back in the background, but I um, teach at Tarab Shevchenko University, um, which is uh, in the middle of Kiev, and uh, they had a missile hit. Um, blew out all the windows of our offices in the, uh, in the law um, department. And as you might have heard about the missile strike on TV, it was in the news a lot because it actually it hit a park in a children's playground uh, right behind the university. So um, it comes pretty close uh, sometimes. Um, the last time I was there, um, I was uh, teach, uh, also teaching your pin which is just north of Kyiv. It's actually where they stopped the Russian advance on, on Kyiv. And I was getting ready one morning, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, getting ready to go out and, you know, get my car up to, out to Irpin. And all of a sudden, uh, it was unusual because it usually happens at night, the missile attack. So this was like the middle of the morning. All of a sudden, Russian cruise missiles start coming in and the Patriot missiles coming up to, uh, to meet them. And it's quite, <laughs> quite, a, quite a spectacle and quite a, a, a racket. It's a, a very strange way to you know, start your day. But, um, and fortunately, the Patriots shot down with about 10 cruise missiles that morning, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of racket. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, Sierra, I wonder if you could speak to actually an idea that in the hour before I came over here, I was listening to the news at, about the Wagner head being on probably the the list that, of passengers that went down, and everyone was qualifying that with, of course, this is user-generated content. These are reports. We haven't confirmed this. There's no official idea. And then someone made a, a comment from the London Times that this is how we're getting a lot of stuff about this war. And it strikes me that in the first 20 minutes here, Zarina is saying, I've got a video mm -hmm. from a friend and we're following this and we're going to see this. And it seems that, I mean, for the first time, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm seeing that play out here in the film. And I wonder how much of, not only in the documentary, could we have probably seen more of that? You know, these videos that then say this might be where the phosphorus fire is coming from and allows people to track certain things. But from the legal perspective, presumably this is where I'm imagining that you're hearing some of these reports from. Yeah, so it's an interesting uh, point. It has, you know, several ramifications um, for the war crimes investigations. Well, I mean, Ukraine is like one giant uh, crime scene. Um, I have a friend that I work with on the, um, on the war crimes investigation, a colonel in the Ukrainian military, and, um, and when, you know, he, uh, when Bucha was liberated, he was one of the first uh, people in there, and of course you can imagine all the chaos and burning tanks and destroying the all the you know, dead people everywhere, and not only Russians, but uh, you know, Ukrainian civilians that they had bound and murdered you know, before they um, got out of there. And you know, imagine trying to get that situation under control, and he was running in there saying, you know, stop, stop, you know, this is a, this is a crime scene. You know, like you, you know, the, you know, the detective is like, you gotta preserve this crime scene. You know, like, you know, the people are like, you're kidding me. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't just stop everything else to, to, uh, to uh, secure the crime scene and investigate everything, although there's a huge amount that has been done every place that the Russians have been kicked out of. You know, Bucha was a famous place. It's the first place that people saw, you know, the, the, what the incredible atrocities were like. Um, a lot of it you don't really hear on the news. I mean, you hear that they were raping the women and that they bound and uh, executed civilians and 
stuff like that. They did stuff that's so much worse. You just you don't even you know you know you can't put it on the news, and um, and it's that way every um, every place that the Russians have been kicked out of, it wasn't just Bucha, but out of Izium and Kherson and uh, Kharkiv, it's the same thing everywhere. Um, and but it is you're correct. It's <laughs> because of you know their cell phones and things now. It's the most probably recorded war in history and also the war crimes most you know recorded in history which is good and bad I mean it's great you have you know all this evidence the other side of it is like it's such a volume of stuff is like how can you ever you know process all of it and a lot of people are jumping in to help which is also good but it also means like you have so many different organizations of Entities, you know, gathering, you know, evidence and how do you, you know, um, um, you know, pull it all together into, you know, one, you know, manageable thing that can be used and then, you know, then turn it into, um, <coughs> you know, evidence uh, for a trial. And that goes back to this, you know, chaotic scene in Bucha. You know, for you know, evidence of the trial, you have to have. You know, authentication and chain of custody, and all this stuff. You know, um, you know, all complicated now by you know the ability to, to you know fake all this stuff, and that's the latest thing. You hear, oh, that was all fake. You know, that really happened. So, um, uh, so it's it's going to be an interesting um, thing going forward to see um, where it, it where it leads, but it's a. Um, it's another thing that's a huge undertaking, and uh, raises the point. Um, you know, one thing I've you know heard more and more lately: people saying, "Oh, we you know we don't need to help Ukraine anymore. We already sent so much help. We already sent so much money." And blah, blah, blah. But that's couldn't be further from the truth. It's a it's a bottomless pit of uh, of, of need. You know, there's not um, it's not like oh we've already done too much. There's Building all of the destruction um, and all of the, um, and you can see some of it in the film. The guy who couldn't stop uh, shaking, you know, the PTSD of the people, you know, the, imagine the, the children who are growing up like this is normal, you know, artillery and missiles uh, flying everywhere, and our neighbor, you know, being blown up at our <laughs> birthday party interrupted by you know, artillery strike. Um, hard to imagine um, all of the consequences of that and then you know the issue of you know all this you know evidence and the crimes and all the you know trials have been like so hard to process you know all the people that were in you know January 6 imagine you know all of all of this and then you know the, you know, the defendants are are Russians <laughs> you know and that's another Observation that all of this is uh, so much of this stuff is on people's um, cell phones. Um, it's it's incredible, and you can stop anybody on the street almost in Ukraine, and they have stuff on their cell phone that will you know just you know uh, is you know hard to even believe, and it's and it's uh, a lot of it <laughs> a lot more very germane and interesting and powerful than you know than what ends up. Um, getting um, put on the news, uh, which that's another old story of how the, you know, the, all the news organizations uh, go over there. And you see a little bit of it in the, in the movie, how they're, you know, led around by the locals, they call them fixers, that, you know, help them, you know, get all these um, stories. And a lot of the people end up being you know, very knowledgeable themselves, but a lot of people go in. <laughs> But um, you know, like I said, you know, people in the streets have better news on their cell phones than you can you know, get on uh, ABC News or something like that. Yeah. So. Uh, 
So in the past, the, the U.S. when they when they try to uh, give their aid to other countries, they usually comes in the form of numbers of the military. Um, aside from that, what's another way you think the U.S. could provide aid to Ukraine? Seeing your experience with all the people there. Well, um, you know they need every uh, every kind of help. So the military, you know, aid of course is um, important. You know, um, another problem in Ukraine. Everybody, you know, the, uh, it makes me kind of sad to see it. The Ukrainians are always trying to raise money. And it's like, you know, you people, <laughs> y'all have nothing. I don't know how y'all, you know. Think about it. how do you even have a functioning economy? How do you have a job with all this war going on? And they're now raising money um, uh, for all these uh, causes. And of course, the, you know, the Ukrainians that have come here, there's a group very active here in Huntsville raising money um, all of the time. But um, you know, I meet people and they say, "Oh, you know, can we raise some money from you?" And I'm, and I'm like. Well, yeah, you can raise some money for me, but I'm going to raise some money from you. If this, uh, this, you get this situation where everybody's raising money, uh, you know, from each other. But, um, you know, just some of the things that I try to help uh, raise money for, well, one, one obviously, these, these films, you know, this part of making a big part of making a film is raising the money to make the film. Um, and then um, I volunteer at the Territorial Defense uh, Training Center do a lot of the training for the Ukrainian armed forces at, and you know imagine you know our uh, military department of defense working this everybody is a volunteer not a single person gets paid there's this huge operation training uh, you know everything from new recruits to special forces and everything else nobody is paid everybody you know putting in all this incredible amount of work but so, um, but even though everybody's a volunteer, there's still like, an incredible amount of, uh, you know, expense uh, involved. Like I spent a lot of time raising uh, money. We have a, a virtual, just to give you one example, a virtual uh, system to train people on all the different weapons, like train to fire a javelin missile and train to fire an RPG and that kind of thing. You know, all of that ammunition is <laughs> really expensive. You can't, you can't have people practice by, you know, you know, one practice shot of a javelin missile. It costs a hundred thousand dollars. So, um, uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing, the Ukrainians are very ingenious. So, a company there, they, you know, created this virtual system where you can do everything, and you actually use the real weapons. You're really holding a javelin, or you're really holding a, you know, RPG launcher. Um, but you don't have to, uh, and if you get the feel of everything, it works exactly the way, you know, the real one works, except for you don't have to, uh, you know, you learn how to sight it, and you can adjust it to every kind of weather condition, you can, you know, have the target be stationary, you can have it be a tank, a truck, all these different things that can be moving, that can be standing still, and you can kind of simulate every every situation it can be raining all these things that would affect uh, your your aim except for you don't have to uh, spend you know fifty or hundred thousand dollars per shot to you know train uh, people so um, uh, um, then um, the universities that I uh, teach at oh my gosh um, if you haven't already been, and you can see the um, photo exhibition tomorrow. Or I don't know if we're maybe gonna some people can walk over here over there after this, but um, it shows the administration building at the university in Erpine that is just you know completely burned out. So you know, trying to help, <laughs> right? You know, imagine if, you know UAH had you know a bunch of its buildings blown up and burned down, and you know trying to not only raise money for that, but, you know, trying to keep the faculty intact where, you know, lots of people have had to, you know, uh, you know, flee the country or half the family, the women and children have left and the men are still there. But even, uh, you know, uh, people I teach with at Tarab Shevchenko, that they have to, <laughs> you know, leave, you know, stop their, you know, interrupt their teaching because they're sent out to the, uh, out to the front and, 
and let alone the issue of you know trying to pay all the uh, faculty. So um, you know, I, so I'm working on creating. I think I you know mentioned joint uh, programs between uh, the Ukrainian and U.S. universities, and that hopefully the U.S. universities will you know provide some um, support, and we're working on. Uh, different specific studies, like at Tara Shevchenko, there's a, uh, we're you know doing a disinformation study to really kind of document how uh, the movie talks a lot about the lies from the Kremlin and then how they come out of Tucker Carlson's mouth and that kind of thing. And we're really trying to you know document that whole uh, thread of how all that happens and the mechanisms and, and the effects of it, and um, and trying to get. U.S. donors and U.S. universities to support it. So, I mean, there's, and then of course, there's all the humanitarian uh, aid, which shows some in the movie, people making food and water and clothes and everything out there. So, I mean, there's just no end to um, uh, ways to help. If anybody, <laughs> anybody wants to make a donation, I could, if there's something, I can give you a you know, long list of things that are very specific, not like, oh, to the Red Cross, but like to, you know, very specific um, places where the money can go, you know, straight into, um, into actions only. Yeah, Jay. I mean, first of all, it's, it's a magnificent film, it really is. I, I have one question, how did you do the aerial shots? Um, uh, well, it's, uh, part of it is drones, but uh, we had a lot of problems. You can imagine you can't just send up a drone <laughs> in Ukraine unless you want it shot down and, and, get, and want to be arrested. So you have to get all kinds of permissions. Um, uh, some of those um, uh, those aerial shots that actually is footage from the Ukrainian military. Got a question for you. Okay, going back to the war crime. I know that uh, Ukrainian had captured one of the Russians that for war crimes and uh, convicted him. So when the war is over, is Ukraine government's going to prosecute it, or are we going to have a trial like the number of trials? Well, that's a good question. All of that stuff is being uh, discussed right now. Of course, you know we'll have to see. You know. Nuremberg, you can have all those trials because we, um, you know, won the war. I, 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 I think um, there's no definition of winning this war that includes like that we go and occupy <laughs> Moscow and like that. So I, I don't know. That's that's going to be a, um, an issue. Some of it might be like some of the, uh, you know, Bosnian trials or. Sorry. And and I, I don't know. All that stuff is there are people everywhere um, meeting, trying to figure all that stuff out uh, right now. But it, we'll have to see how it turns out. So, what impressed you most about the Ukrainian people when you was over there? Well, um, I think. Um, and I, uh, if you're interested in that question, you should, there's a, uh, op -ed I wrote for AL.com. There's one that I wrote that actually came out in the paper yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was one that came out over the 4th of July weekend. If you just type in AL.com, Humphrey is my last name in Ukraine, they'll, they'll come up. But, um, you know, what I said over the, um, 4th of July weekend is that um, uh, you know we're supposed to be the example of the world but it's actually you know Ukraine mm -hmm. is the example of the world and they're teaching us hopefully remind us of who you know we're supposed to be and um, uh, and a couple of uh, it comes a lot of things but one we don't really want an authoritarian leader here we don't want other countries to have to live under authoritarian leaders, and you know we, you know, believe in our, um, uh, in our, you know, freedom and our freedom to 
say what we think without uh, um, going to prison like Navalny or drinking polonium tea or having Novak Jock uh, administered to us and, or fall out of a window or you know, be in a plane crash. And um, so I, I think you just have to start and end with the bravery of the Ukrainian people who could have easily said, uh, like, uh, we can't stand up to Russia, so maybe we just better give up. And, um, and they clearly um, did not um, do that. And, um, uh, but that's an easy thing to talk about and a harder thing to do. What, what they were faced with, you know, they could <laughs> see the Russian <laughs> tanks and the artillery, you know, pouring in, and, and they, um, stood up to him, and that's just an incredible thing, and it would easily not happen that way, and, um, and I'm you know, hoping that the fact that the Ukrainians did that will be a turning point, not just for them, but for us and for the whole world, which seem to have you know, you know, gotten in this you know, love affair with um, strong men dictators or something, and that that will reverse itself thanks to the Ukrainians. Gotcha. So I noticed that some of the uh, cities you went to, are you planning on going to like uh, Odos, Od Odessa, or some of the other cities? Uh, yeah, or? I'm eventually going to try to um, you know, go um, everywhere. And, um, Carby, yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of it is reporting and writing and investigating, but also um, uh, the photography. So I hope that the, the little um, uh, photo exhibition that we have here now is just a small taste of, of, uh, of what we'll be able to produce um, eventually from all over Ukraine. So most of your documents going to be just on uh, war crimes or or other well, subject matters? Uh, I mean, uh, we have uh, different things that we're uh, working on. I think there'll be a, you know, a follow-up um, to this. I was, when I was just over there for the last three months, I was hoping that we'd have a, uh, be able to film and photograph uh, uh, something similar to what happened a, a year ago, which was massive liberation of lots of, uh, of territory and you know and that's um, you know, incredible um, to see when the um, Ukrainian forces came back in and the, you know uh, the welcome that they had uh, the people there's um, there's a particular um, case that I'm working on um, that probably um, turn into a movie um, so it's all of this big thing on a you know smaller you know uh, more personal scale you know dealing with the story of, of one family and um, and then as I said then the other um, two movies that I'm <coughs> helping with are are uh, both about Mariupol ones about the actual the you know battle and you know the defense of Mariupol and others the story of a, of a you know well both true stories of a, um, of a, a child who kept a diary and so it's all you know again which I think is very important this whole saga told through the perspective of a of a child and um, like I said I don't I just I don't know how but, you know. We'll find out in 20 years what the effect of all this has been on the, you know, the five-year-olds that are living through it. So does the uh, people of Ukraine uh, trust the President Zelensky since because of the beginning of the war, before the war started, February 24, 2022, telling the people that Russia was not going to attack and this or that? And, 
well, does majority of the people that's, support the government? That's government. not a factor. That's a, you know, well, and that's, what, you know, one day we'll get like into the real grit the of pain, the story. Yeah. But, you know, I, you know, came from all this, you know, working in Washington and working in the Senate. And um, you always see that the people that you, you know, hold up as the great leaders mm -hmm. that we idolize or whatever, if you look too closely, it's like, <laughs> See. Right. And nobody's um, perfect, but you know what I always tell people is like, uh, I don't think you know Zelensky's perfect. I don't think anybody really faults him for that. I think that no, was nobody's you know, perfect. partly no. trying to keep people calm. And I, and I, I don't, Ukrainians don't fault him for that because um, you know it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Sometimes we don't believe what we see, and we've had a lot of that in our mm -hmm. country for the last few years of like. I can't believe this is happening. This kind of thing can't happen. You can't have people storming the U.S. Capitol, and you know we, we just don't want to believe that it's, uh, that it's happening. And, and every Ukrainian I've ever talked to said, until the day that the Russian tanks crossed the border, no matter what was in the news about the buildup or what right. anybody was saying, the intelligence agents or anything else, they all said we never believed for a second that they would actually do it. Again, and, you know, in this day and age, it's like a huge norm to bust. Is like that's not <laughs> that's not supposed to happen in 2022. That you have a uh, you know uh, World War II style invasion of a neighboring country like that. But um, but that was you know another thing that couldn't happen that did. So, with uh, since you work with the military some there in Ukraine with the international, I know um, does some of the soldiers have to buy their equipment, like yeah, uh, no, that's the helmets and I stuff mean, uh, and everything too. I talk about people raising money all the time. There are people raising money uh, for uh, different military units, raising money, like I said, for the our virtual you know weapon systems. Uh, and people raising money for their own, um, you know, family members. And I've helped people, uh, you know, I'm going back and forth, a lot of things they can't get there, so I've helped people get, like, you know, armor plating for their cell phones, which we don't normally need walking around, but, you know, they, um, uh, which they do. So, um, it, it's, that's one weird thing about it, is this, uh, part of the war is this, incredible kind of entrepreneurial uh, go fund me whatever going on uh, right. even as you know all of the you know large scale aid is you know coming in from a, uh, western uh, countries and it's a little, actually kind of scary to see how um, you know the Russians were stopped from getting to key by a lot of Self initiative and, mm -hmm. and local, you know, militia groups that weren't necessarily part of any, you know, greater um, command and control, and just decided, you know, we're going to do this, like, um, uh, like blow up that bridge at Irpin uh, that stopped the, the Russians from getting to Kiev. Uh, yes, sir. That's fine. One last question. Uh, where is this going? Uh, is it going to be shown in festivals? Yeah, so it is going around to some festivals and things now, and there's actually um, a distribution uh, company um, called Journeyman Films that's uh, buying the rights, and um, it'll be edited a little bit from the you know, version you saw. I think it's actually going to be renamed, but uh, anyway, that's um, that's their decisions and, and then um, but we're not really sure what's you know that's a distribution company so it's their job to you know you know to um, but um, but hopefully it'll, it'll end up on you know HBO or Netflix or something that might be able to scroll when you're when you're flying next time you're flying to London you might be on your <laughs> screen of your plane I, you know, but that's all very complicated well, thank you so much.
So I went to Ukraine just to sort of look around, yeah, that's and I just happened idea. to run into yeah, having yeah. dinner with the chef or something. It happened to be a public yeah. school. Uh, the, the thing about it is that they would have to speak French and probably be best for somebody that's interested in talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So I would have to know who's ready to be a documentary channel. And he might be ready that way they're taking the class and they can relate to what this project is about. So that's kind of the summer work, yep. Well, yeah. I had plenty. So I got to think through who's who's still talking. Where is he? Or she? Jacob, I'll be talking. I